I'm consistently surprised by Audemars Piquet's ability to sell out their watches and remain popular. Time and time again, they've put out watches where I think that's a weird choice, and yet they're one of the most profitable and popular watchmakers in the world. In the latest Morgan Stanley report, after all, they were fourth behind only Cartier, Omega, and Rolex. They have grown massively, and there is no sign of them slowing down. And yet, I'm not sure this is going to continue. Nothing, except for the negative internet comments on Hodinkee, Fratello, and YouTube, seems to indicate that they're looking into a downturn. But I'm just, I don't know, worried for AP. With the release of the limited edition LX9 SM models, I'm even more concerned for AP. So, numbers and performance be damned, we have to talk about the LX9 SM models, the AP Spider-Man, and a term called self-induced volatility. It seems redundant going through the basics of a minimum $70,000 full gold limited edition watch that I haven't seen in the metal, but here goes. You've got 50 meters of water resistance, you've got around 60 or 70 hours of power reserve, a thickness ranging from 9 to 15.4 millimeters for the chronos, the dials are gold, white gold or black PVD, and they can all be yours for somewhere between $70,000 and $111,000. I'm not totally certain about the weight, but if it's anything like the previous generation of the Royal Oak Brick, you're getting yourself a watch that clocks in somewhere north of 300 grams. This is going to be ridiculously heavy, especially the Chronos. What do I think? This is where I tread carefully, so I have to make some qualifying statements. The Royal Oak, in my eyes, is generally speaking one of the most beautiful watch designs ever made. They have perfected this design. Some models are better executed than others, but generally I love the Royal Oak design. In the offshore models, the greens are my favorites. Not a big fan of the gray or sand fume models, but overall, even the bigger offshores look cool to me. Some are unwearable, but you know, I quite like them. The Royal Oak Chrono is an absolute stunner and the tapisserie dial is one of the best in the business. I even liked the previous version of the Royal Oak Brick. I had the luxury of wearing one once, and it's quite a workout. It looks totally over the top, but for what it is, it looks really cool. I've said now that I love the Royal Oaks, even some that many other people dislike. This watch, though, I hate it with a passion. I'm absolutely flabbergasted personally about this design, and I do not get it at all. The problem is, of course, the dial. The rest is like so many other full gold APs, but a totally flat dial devoid of indices, markers, subdials is to me what a first year wannabe design student would come up with if someone asked them to design a minimalist dial. The chronograph dial is by far the worst simply because you have a unusable chronograph function. Sure, I could mentally guess my way to figuring out how many seconds and minutes have elapsed, but it's just so very, very wrong. I remember once when I was like in one of those cheap sort of Bangkok backstreet market watch kind of places that had a painted moon phase on a dial. It was a quartz watch and the moon phase was not functional, but this was one of those watches that just had to look like an expensive watch. This is very much the feeling that I have with the Alex models. I can get behind form over function to some extent, but this is form completely devoid of function. Add to that the minimalist dials in themselves. They are a monstrosity, and the only thing that went through my mind when I saw these press photos was, that's a $100,000 MVMT watch. That ultra-minimalist, ultra-basic dial is not only totally MVMT, it's also totally 2019. But my opinion doesn't matter. My opinion on the look of a watch is not a statement of fact. It's a personal one, and if you like it, cool. Additionally, I, after all, cannot afford this watch. I'm not the target audience. And we all know that these watches will likely sell out. And yet this watch seems to be an indication of a very risky path that AP is taking that I just don't agree with. In 2021, Thierry Stern, the head of Patek Philippe, when discontinuing the 5711 said, we don't want a single model to suddenly become 50% or more of our collection and dominate Patek's image. Both AP and Patek have in the last four or five years seen a massive rise in popularity, partly if not solely due to pop culture, rappers and other new money celebrities having gravitated towards their brands. The models that were most popular were the Nautilus and the Equinaut and for AP, the Royal Oak. 
Patek have for the most part chosen not to lean into this popularity, opting instead for a more conservative, stay the course approach to maintaining their brand position. In recent years, models like the 6007G are shifting that position ever so slightly, but by and large, Patek hasn't leaned into the popularity and rather chosen almost to shy away from it. AP, on the other hand, have gone an entirely different route. AP have likely always been the more avant-garde brand of the Holy Trinity, more edgy and daring in many ways, but this has become even more pronounced in the last couple of years. AP is also very much aware of their reputation as a one-trick pony and have introduced the 1159. The initial 1159 release was not particularly impressive, but in the second generation, they have approached something that's more palatable for many. That said, it's still the Royal Oak that does the heavy lifting. The main focus of their brand is still the Royal Oak in its many variations, and I'm not just talking about Slims and Jumbos and Chronos. AP has become the brand that does the fully iced out watches, Black Panther concept watches, the AP Royal Oak Music Edition, and most recently the AP Spider-Man. Some of these watches like the Music Edition I appreciate, where models like the Spider-Man I find absolutely hideous. They might be well made, but to me it's, you know, a Nixon. The problem with AP is not though that I or others think that one specific release is ugly or not. That's got nothing to do with it. Somebody's buying them, so they're doing fine, right? Well, the problem's an entirely different one. And here we have to talk about stability and volatility. Think of a company like H&M, the clothing store. What do they sell? Fashion. More importantly, they sell fast fashion. Their entire model is built on being cheap, but also getting trendy, popular designs out in the stores as quickly as possible. Last month's designs don't sell. It's what's hot right now that's important. So H&M has their own designers, but they also have people just sitting at model runways looking at what is being rolled out and running back to the sweatshop and producing a low-cost version of whatever is hot right now. I kid you not, H&M will follow Instagram and see if something catches on. If it does and they don't have that something in their lineup, they will do their best to get it into their lineup like yesterday. What about Hermes? What is their pace of change compared to H&M? It's definitely slower. It's probably slower than Gucci, Louis or Prada that all thrive to some extent on trend. So now, clothing, as we have to remember, is not the same as watches. There's a seasonality cycle to clothing that you don't see in watches. But the key point I'm making is that even within clothing, some brands lean very far into trend, newness and popularity, where others stay the course and are more gradual to change. Nothing's right or wrong. The brand that moves more slowly still has to keep up to not become dated and irrelevant. But compared to those brands that choose to be in the eye of the storm, they are in the short term under less pressure. So H&M, for example, essentially has a more volatile nature where Hermes is more stable. Hermes emphasizes quality, exclusivity, beauty over popularity, newness and day-to-day -day relevance. AP, what are they doing? Well, every time they release a Spider-Man, a music edition, promote their links to rappers, sports celebrities, or do a collab with a fashion designer, who I've never heard of, AP introduces more volatility into their brand. AP still has only the Royal Oak as the only watch anybody really cares about. The 1159 may sell fine, but rappers don't care about it, and many regular enthusiasts don't either, really. The Royal Oak is still all they have, and they're pushing to make it even more volatile. Any chance they have to get it into the media cycle, the fashion mill, the pop world, they do so. And I think it's an incredibly risky strategy. Someday, eventually, suddenly, rappers, celebrities, the trendy, are going to lose interest. Because that's what they do. They lose interest and move on. It's the very nature of popularity and trend that people move on. Marvel has been the dominant box office juggernaut for 13 years and the AP Spider-Man came out where the consensus is that something drastic has to change to the MCU if it isn't to be viewed as being on its death throes. The Black Panther came out at the height of the MCU. The Spider-Man came out during a Marvel down cycle. This is why I really don't understand AP's reasoning. I think it's good that they stay as edgy as they historically have been compared to the more conservative Patek and Vacheron. But the level of aggressive leaning into trend cannot in the long term be seen as anything other than a very, very risky approach to brand management. 
They still make good watches, but putting your one royal oak egg into the hands of a fundamentally fickle audience does not make sense to me. It seems to me that they speak to this fickle audience at every given opportunity, and that's inherently risky. Here we haven't even spoken about how more hardcore, loyal AP fans cannot become anything but disillusioned or feel alienated by these trendy fashion forward designs and collaborations. Every Spider-Man, every Alex risks pushing stable buyers away while drawing the volatile, fickle buyers closer, thereby introducing more and more volatility to their brand. Especially when looking at this latest release. Like I said, I think it's hideous. To me, it seems rushed and that's what happens when you have to keep up with trend and popularity. You make mistakes, you roll a miss out and that miss can potentially cost you. There was this TV show back in the 60s or 70s and 80s in the last century, which was called Happy Days. And there's a term from there that's called jumping the shark. It's a term that's used when a TV show just really isn't good anymore and it starts dying. To me, the Alex AP seem like AP potentially jumping the shark. Is it the end of AP? No. H&M and many other brands have shown for decades that they are capable of staying in that trendy eye of the storm. Maybe AP can as well constantly staying relevant with new outlandish and crazy designs. Doing what AP does does not mean they are predetermined to fall or destined to eventually drop off a cliff. But they are, for sure, running a very risky strategy. And if they ever do see those fickle trendsetters leave them, the cliff they will fall off will be huge. There's no way I would chart this course for a company, not a watch company at least, but as people would point out, it's worked for them until now, so what do I know? Nevertheless, I would definitely go slow and be more careful with my brand. I would be a bit more boring. I think it's a more safe and a more successful long-term strategy. And if you don't think I'm right, all I'll say is, have you ever heard of Rolex? That's what I think. What are your thoughts? Let me know in the comments. Like, subscribe, cheers. And I got all the way through this video without mentioning Hublot once.